Hello, and welcome to the Beginner Guide to One Piece, Episode 9, The History of Nico Robin. Robin made her first appearance in Manga Chapter 114 of the Alabaster Arc, corresponding with Anime Episode 67. I was unable to find Robin concept art, and what I want people to understand here is that even though the concept art for the crew had been released, Oda had not given out the information on who would be who. So, I don't know who, what one of the characters on that list is Robin. In the picture you are saying, I don't know which one is Robin, maybe none of them are Robin, we don't know. But, there is no individual concept art for Robin, I'm sorry. But we are going to need, we need to skip this part of the video. I'm sorry, guy. Oda had said before that Robin was to be a nationality, Robin would be Russian. This is, of course, if Robin was a real person. It had been stated by Ichida Oda himself that Robin gets a total of seven hours of sleep every night, that being one less than Nami, the only other female straw hat. Robin is one of the four devil fruit users on the straw hat pirate. Robin is the eater of the Hanahana no Mi, or the flower flower fruit, which gives her the ability to grow limbs in other places and pretty much create multiple limbs and clones of herself and things of that nature. But now that we got over facts about Nico Robin, let's go into her backstory and I mean, I'm getting a little emotional right now just because Robin backstory is Well, be prepared. Robin has a very, very depressing backstory. Nico Robin was born on the island of Ohada and comes from a family of archaeologists. Her mother, Nico Olvia, went out to sea to find the true history. Meaning, her mother went out to sea to gather information on the Void Century and learn what events took place during the Void Century. If you want to know more about the Void Century, go look it up or wait until I make my video on what the Void Century is. This event of her leaving took place when Robin was two years old, leaving her in the care of Nico Olvia's brother and his wife, Roji, I believe it is pronounced. While Robin's father was never revealed, Od Olvia stated that she will honor her husband's dream. She then left to study the photoglyphs, which are the stones that contain the information on the Lloyd Century. Robin later wandered into the Tree of Knowledge, which is a historical tree on the island of Ohio, and was allowed to read the book held within, held within on Cl Professor Clover's invitation. Roju, which I, Roji, Roju, whatever his name is, both physically and verbally abused Robin over mental and medial actions. His actions were abusive, in other words. He abused her. Child abuse, if you will. Roji made it obvious time and time again that Robin was not wanted. She was expected to keep out of sight and she was not allowed to participate in family celebrations. The powers of her developer often freaked out or scared the other children on top of that. She would often overhear the conversations of parents telling her children to avoid her at all costs, as well as other children calling her a demon. Her only friends were the scholars at the Tree of Knowledge with Professor Clover of the Archaeology Lab, being a friend of her mother, try, th was trying to take care of her. Now, I always had a problem with this. I'm not going to go into my opinion on this for a brief period. This doesn't really make any sense, in my opinion, because Devil Fruit that Ohana, the people of Ohana are smart people. They should not be bothered by Devil Fruit. You can tell I'm a little speechless when I talk about this, because I just don't understand why a devil fruit eater scares these people. I don't understand it considering how common the devil fruit is. 
The only place that we've ever been in the series where Medellifer was considered non-common and special was the East Blue. But that's my opinion. I don't think it makes any sense for him to be afraid of her. But that's my opinion. Let's continue with the history of Nico Robin. Now, Robin is a damn good archaeologist. Because at only 8 years old, she ate an archaeology exam and was officially inducted as a scholar. However, when she announced that like her mother, she wanted to find out the true history, the true unrecorded history of the world, she was reapproved by Clover, who told her that she would get banned from the library and to continue to find other scholars. Scholars, I mean. Now, the reason Clover did this, I'm going to go into the reason, it because it had been revealed later on in the story, and it's vaguely and it's very heavily talked about that the government has made it illegal to study the voice century. So what Clover is doing here is essentially protecting Robin from the government because if she doesn't study the voice century, she can't get in trouble. Like the government can't brand her as a criminal. So, but now we need to continue. So let's continue. After Clover told Robin that she would be banned from the library and she could continue to spy on them and study the Poneglyph and the true century, the voice century, whatever you want to call it. Robin responded by running off crying and headed to the northwest beach of Ohio where she met a giant named Jaguar D. Stahl. Now, if you're new to One Piece and you're watching these videos for information, remember every character with the D in their name because the D is very important and will become even more important later on. But the characters that had D in their names are very important. But, the who Jaguar D. Saul had washed up on the beach, and the two became friends. Robin continued to visit him for the following four days while he built his raft. After Saul found out he was on Ohana, and figured out that Robin was only a daughter, he informed Robin about battleships that were on their way to, to Ohana to destroy the scholars, Due to the fact that they were studying the Poneglyph. Now, I just want to clear up a couple of things here that I'm not necessarily going to have a chance to touch upon. One is that Skull is a Navy Vice Admiral, and he has encountered Nico Olvia on his journey, who had, of course, committed the crime of doing this. Now, the only thing I have the problem with here is I'm not the biggest fan of the fact that Skull didn't find out right away. Like, Saul, the Navy Vice Admiral, so the fact that he didn't figure out where he was right away is a little weird, especially considering he's a fucking giant. So he guys can see a lot more things than the average person, and considering he was talking to Robin. But, but that is beside the point. I just wanted to point out the small little thing. But let's continue. Nico Olvia had recently escaped off of a marine ship and returned to Ohara due to the efforts of Saul. You have to watch the theory to see Saul helping her out. But pretty much, the government announced what they were going to do. They were going to attack Ohada. And Saul was like, he realized morally. He was like, he was against it. He was like, you can't just wipe out all these people because they were studying something. That's not morally right. So Saul acted against the government, which in one piece is fucking suicide. You don't act against the world government. I'm sorry. You just don't do that. But... She informed the archaeologist that her colleagues had been killed by the Navy, and she told them that the ma Marines were able to infer that Ohada was their homeland base on the island they put out on the ship, and they were headed toward Ohada, likely to kill them. The archaeologists, however, refused to leave. They wished to continue to protect the tree and the knowledge they had worked so hard to research and produce. And I loved them. I loved them. But... I feel like this is a great thing, it's really good writing, and this is just why Robin had one of the best backstories, and definitely the best backstory out of all the Straw Hat, and hand down, one of the best backstories in the entire series. But, that's my opinion, let's go back to her history. When Olivia was warned that CP9 was on shore, she rushed out of the tree of knowledge, running past her daughter without notice. So, only a kind of this. She kind of ignored her daughter. I'm kidding. I felt like making a joke about her being a bitch because 
It's funny. But Robin arrived. <coughs> Sorry about that. Robin arrived at the Tree of Knowledge and asked Clover about her mother's whereabouts. As a one-thing woman, Olvia went to cut all time with her daughter. I mean, you have to remember, Olvia is only one-thing because the government is insane and is pretty much saying she studied this history, she needs to be killed. She's a criminal for studying something. So she didn't, so she's not a bad person. Olvia is a woman that loved her daughter tremendously. She's a good woman. She just happened to want information. But the point is that to protect Robin, she had to cut all ties with her. If the government finds out Robin is her daughter, the government is going to do what they did with a poor guy's DH. And they're going to be like, oh, you're, a, and you're their child. You must be as bad as them because, you know, you have the blood of someone that committed a crime in you. Therefore, you committed, therefore, you should suffer for your parents' sin. That's how the world government works. But, so the purpose of doing this was, as I had said, so that Robin might not be associated with her criminal mother. Doing as Olivia wanted, Clover denied that Robin's mother was on the island. But Robin, being a very smart girl, seemed skeptical. Clover quickly changed the topic and urged Robin to leave, and not to mention that she's an archaeologist, or she might be arrested too. Robin was fugitive and CP9 busted into the Tree of Knowledge and began searching for the Poneglyph that they had on Ohana. Outside, agents warned the island residents to move to the evacuation ship or be destroyed, which is very nice of them. Right? You would hope? More on that later. Olivia confronted Spandline, the director of CP9, whose name is actually a pun, or I guess a spin-off, or inspired by the future head of CP9 who is leading it when the Straw Hats engage them in battle, Ban Dumb. This guy's name is Ban Line. Get it? It's a joke. It's like a pun on it. But, <coughs> the director of CP9 at this time, but was quickly subdued by the brute force of his agents. Back at the Tree of Knowledge, all the archaeologists were arrested and taken to the outside the tree. And once again, Clover urged Robin to escape, but she refused with more. Fanline and the rest of CP9. And I just want to point this out quickly. If you don't know, CP9 then for Cyberpola 9. And I will do a video in the future explaining what Cyberpola 9 is. Yeah, I'm dropping, I'm getting a lot of video topics during this video. You know, a lot of these things that are mentioned in here, the their entire video is dedicated to them, but whatever. They a lot to Fandom and the rest of CP9 arrived with a greatly wounded Olvia, who who instantly recognized her daughter once her name is spoken. CP9 found the Poneglyph in the basement of the tree. And Fanline sentenced the archaeologist to death by Buster Call. Now, once again, I will make a video discussing the Buster Call. But in short, what a Buster Call is, is when you have a Golden Transponder Snail, and using the Golden Transponder Snail, you summon a fleet of warships, and those warships will blow up an island, and kill all, and kill everybody on the island. That's pretty much how it works. And each little warship is handled and led by a Vice Admiral. <coughs> but, let's continue. However, Clover began to speak out. He began talking to the Gorathe, the heads of the world government, the five elder stars, via Bandline Dendemuchi, or his, in English, Transponder Snail, stating his theory on why the government really wanted to keep the voice entry a secret. However, before Clover could reveal the name of the civilization he spoke of, he was shot point blank and mortally wounded. Now, what I want you to take note of here, is that even to this day, now, in like the chapter like 817, as of the recording of this video, the, the name of this kingdom had not been given out. So the reason he was killed was very clearly, because we're not meant to know the name of the kingdom yet. That was clearly the reason story-wise he was killed. But, seeing that the battleship had already arrived, Saul rushed off to find Robin. As the attack on Ohana began, it was discovered that Robin had also had the ability to read Poneglyph because Robin, being a child 
after you were an emotional incident with her mother, she, her mother started telling her to leave, and Robin pretty much said, No, I want to stay with you, and you'll be very proud of me, because I can read the Poneglyph too. This a gorp makes DP9 freak the fuck out. They're like, this girl, oh, this girl can read the Poneglyph too? We'll murder the child like well. I know, Robin has a very fucked up backstory. You can already tell where this is going, probably. But, it was revealed that Thaw was a former bike admiral that had aided Nico Olvia with her escape. Olvia asked Thaw to make sure her daughter was taken safely off the island and told Robin that she must continue to live. Robin begged to stay with her mother, but Ol Olvia insisted on staying as there was something more that she had to do, but they pretty much try to protect the tree of knowledge in his book. Saul followed Olvia Gwitz and managed to reach the island shore, but Marine just spotted him. Remember, Saul's a giant, so spotting him wouldn't be that hard. They then, being the bastards that they are, opened fire. Seeing as he was carrying Robin, Saul put her down and, you know, he attacked back in anger for almost hurting Robin and destroyed several Navy ships. This is the power of a Navy Vice Admiral, people. Because the, the rank of Vice Admiral is normal, it's a very vague rank. Because, like, people say Vice Admiral level, it's like, what the hell is Vice Admiral level? Vice Admiral level could be multiple things. So I want to make it clear, but whatever. Getting back to the topic at hand, Robin tried to make for the eva evacuation ship, but trying to use her Hana Hana no Mi ability to get aboard frightened the people, plus... Bandline told her not to let her on the ship since she claimed she is an archaeologist. Though this would be fortunate for Robin, Saul noticed Bandline and charged his ship for his foolishness. But Vice Admiral Kuzan, who would later go on to become an Admiral of the Navy, whose Delafruit is an ice-based Delafruit that is incredibly powerful, prevented him from getting that far, challenging him to a battle. The evacuation ship was destroyed by another Vice Admiral, a very well-known character to be polite. That character is Sazanuki, who would later go on to become Admiral Akainu, who is the man who would later go on to murder Porgoth D8, the brother of Monkey D. Luffy, who, who did it as a, and he did it as a precaution, if any of the archaeologists had snuck on board. Now, I don't agree with this necessarily. He stuck what El Akainu or Sazuki said it is. I don't believe that for one freaking minute. This is Akainu, Alkiji, I'm mean, Akainu or Sazuki. He has shown the floor that he just kills people just because he wants to sometimes. So I would not be surprised if it was one of those instances where he said it was a precaution. But it could also be viewed in the way of the fact that he probably just wanted to kill them. But this act disgusted both Saul and even Kuzan. Because you gotta remember, Kuzan and Akainu, or Tanizuki, are opposite. Kuzan is a very kind-hearted man. He, he does work for the Navy, but he, he does know that there is a moral limit to what you can do. And he knows when he's like, no, that's just fucking wrong. But whatever. Saul tried to get away with Robin, but he was frozen by Kuzan's ice ability. The technique Kuzan used was his ice age technique. One of Kuzan's few techniques, because, well, actually, I don't know why. Just Oda just doesn't like naming Kuzan's attack for some reason. I really don't know why he does that. But whatever. Before being completely encased in ice, Robin encouraged... Stop, stop, fuck it. Sorry, guys. Saul encouraged Robin to escape and that her friends were out there in the ocean waiting for you. His quote is one of my favorite quotes in the entire theory. We did pretty much when he said, Robin, the world is vast. Remember that no one is born into this world to be alone. I, I love the quote. It's a very emotional scene. You really, it's good in the manga, but this is a scene you have got to watch in the anime. And if you're still catching up to the series, or you haven't rewatched really it in a while, go watch this scene. Because this scene is fucking beautiful. It really is. It's beautiful. But, whatever. So what happened next was that his last, his last act was to laugh as he was frozen, sticking to his, the, the soft, 
Sticking it to, to his belief to laugh from his heart, even in bad times, as most barons of the D. This is where we get into what I mean by the D is important. We don't know why it is, but as almost every other bearer of the D, no, as, as every other bearer of the D had done, he died with a smile on his face when he died, when he was dying, he was happy, which is something that's common with all the D. But, back at the Tree of Knowledge, all the other clover and the other scholars had tossed out as many books as they could into the ocean, and so future generations could find them with I have a problem with it because books are made of paper. So won't the paper kind of be like destroyed by the water? I'm just saying. Whatever. They then realized that there was nothing more they could do and stood there in the tree as it burned around them. Only apologized to Robin for not leaving any parting words as a mother. Did you have to look at her parting words were pretty much just an order? And some advice as an archaeologist. She didn't leave any info. It wasn't like with the Nami backstory with Bellamere, how Bellamere's parting words were her her affection for her children. Her parting words were pretty much like, kid, you better not die. And by the way, the, do something with the Ponoglyph. Like, they weren't very they weren't very motherly words. And she apologized for that. But Robin ran to her last raft that Saul had built. Only to met by Kuzan. Kuzan, being the honorable man he is, told her that he was letting her go. Since he was curious as to why Saul risked his life for her. <coughs> However, Kuzan warned her that he will be the first to come after her if she tries anything. Robin then left on a boat, guided by an ice path Kuzan had set for her. Remembering Saul's word, she tried to laugh, but wept. As Ohana were burned to the ground, we left her as the only survivor. Now, I want to mind you here. Robin is eight years old. Eight years old. All of this. As I said in the beginning of her, the history of Robin. She's fucking eight. Yeah. This is fucked up. But now we will get into the history of her 20 years on the run. Robin was found by a warship heading northwest of the West Blue. When she boarded it, somehow her bounty pitcher would take it. You know, that's the explanation to all of the bounty pitchers. Somehow. We don't even see the guy that takes these damn things. One of them is a Nami doing a pogue we've never even seen or fucking do. I mean, really, it's getting ridiculous at this point. But whatever. <clears throat> Banline angrily explained to Sengoku, who I believe was the fleet admiral at the time, Due to, due to the context of their conversation and the time placement of this flashback, I do believe he was the Fleet Admiral. However, he could have been an Admiral only, with the Fleet Admiral being Kong. I could be wrong. However, Kong is, of course, currently the Commander-in-Chief of the Marine, with Sengoku being his, the only person below him. But, but uh, the thing was, with the Band line ship was caught on ice by a court Kuzan. For the world government to capture her, he intended putting a bounty on her head and sent marines and agents to hunt her down, spreading the lie that she had sank ship, sick warship. Now, the bounty they put on her head, her head was 79 million. That's mind blowing, isn't it? The government is willing to go that far. To keep the secret of the void century, well, a secret, that they put, made a eight year old girl worth 79 million berries. Which is higher than Luffy's original bounty for taking out Sawtooth Arlong, a man who had enslaved in a town of people for eight years. So, be active being able to read a rock is worth than eight years of enslavement. I'm going to point that out there, but. The, the world government labeled her the Demon of Ohada, and the reason of this is because the world government gets a label to everyone. Pirate Hunter Zoro, Straw Hat Luffy, Cat Burglar Nami, Black Lake Nanji, White, and Whitebeard. His name isn't fucking Whitebeard, it's Edward Nugget, but they call him Whitebeard. But, you get the gist of it. They lied to the public that the Ohadas, or Ohada Urans, or how you say it, 
We're trying to find the ancient weapon to destroy the world. Look, we're not what Ohana was, was trying to do. Now, I want to make it clear that this isn't just for the people of Ohana. This seems to be their normal cover-up. Like, when they had to wipe a group of people out because they studied the voice entry, their cover-up is, oh, they were, they were trying to find the ancient weapon to destroy the world. Okay, I don't know why they were going to blow up the planet, but okay, whatever. <clears throat> out of paranoia, out of what would become of her, out of paranoia of what would become of her, the world government br spread the word that she posed a threat, and soon the world would brainwash into thinking that Robin was trying to destroy the world. The negative gossip spread around the world, creating a half truth myth. Turns like Demon Woman were born along with the belief that her very existence is a sin and considered her a terror. Robin's innocent life was ruined, and she grew up hating the government for the crime they committed against her. Robin went to many different people for the past 20 years, as they passed, all of whom tried to turn her, turn her in or kill her. Robin first encountered such the tent when she was taken in by an old farm lady who, who, work, who she worked for, and thought was kind. One night, the old farm lady told Robin that before they could eat, she had visitors. The visitors turned out to be world government agents attempting to kill her. The old farm lady was laughing, yelling to the alien, Now give me my money. I turned her in to, for you. As he pulled the agent's clothes in anger. Next, Robin was taken in by a couple who once again worked hard for her. She worked hard for the couple. During the night, she overheard people talking about turning Robin in, and Robin then fled. After they angrily called Robin an unfortunate woman who betrayed their kindness, with, you know, of course, of course it's then covering it up. But whatever. Robin joined her first pirate crew at age 8. However, after the world government caught up with her new crew, they assumed she had betrayed them, she fled before more pirates turned their anger against her. They even threw curses at her, calling her trouble. After that, Robin would often sit on a rock in the pouring lane, and the dog came to her begging for food. Robin apologized and said, Deru shi 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 shi, which is the way Saul laughed in the manga for the last time. Robin then tried to help out in a shop, but the owner whacked her with a stick in anger, telling her that she was not allowed in. When she turned 16 years old, this is where things get interesting. Robin joined an unknown organization, but it wasn't long before she betrayed the organization. At age 23, she entered the Grand Line for the West, when the West blew, where Mari Joros, or, or Marine Ford, is located. At age 24, she joined the Baroque Work, an organization that was led by the warlord Crocodile, who needed her ability to read the protocol and managed to stay on long term staying hidden away from the world government while employed in the organization. Now, what I also want to point out is that while it is unknown whether or not Crocodile's name would have protected Robin. The Crocodile being a warlord, the people that work under him should be safe from the government, but the government is honestly very afraid of Robin, so I don't know how that works. And we will probably not know because this circumstance will probably not come up. Now, while I honestly can't go into all of Robin's actions throughout the Alabaster arc, due to the fact that, of course, this is One Piece and it's an incredibly long series, and this video is already long enough as it is. But what I do want to get into is that Robin's power has drastically changed throughout the series. Because when Robin was introduced, she was able to take out the monster trio of Luffy, Sanji, and Zoro all at once. Now, while I don't, now, well, I don't think taking out Robin, I mean, I don't think Robin taking out Sanji is much of an accomplishment, because Sanji won't fight back against the woman, she still took out both Zoro and Luffy, something that is very difficult to do easily when introduced. However, after the events of the Alabaster arc, when Robin asked Luffy if she can join his crew, due to the fact that she needs somebody to Stay with. She needs a crew to be with, and she had nowhere to go. She needs somewhere to go, so she's like, "Can I join your crew?" 
Honestly, Luffy took down a crocodile. So, Luffy and Cork replied with, yeah. And after that, she seemed to be depowered. Now, I'm not sure this is because, this is because she's a woman. That is possibly it. It could also just due to be due to the fact that maybe Oda didn't want her to be a fighter. Maybe because she doesn't like fighting. I'm not really sure. But the next major event that happened with Robin is take place after the Kaipia and Davy Mac fight arc, where they run into Kuzan and Alkiji once again, and he was pretty much revealed he needs to catch the Robin. Now, Luffy said no. They fight Alkiji. He's an admiral. He gets their ass. They lose. Now, the event go and follows. Robin turns herself into CP9 to protect them. The straw has to show up at any lobby. And what Luffy pretty much tells Robin is, I want you to live. Because at this point, Robin wants to die. She's been through hell. Her life is shit. She wants to die. <coughs> and Luffy and the straw hats are pretty much like, no. The straw hats are all standing there. And he's like, tell me you want to live. And she just died for once in her life. She's going to listen to Saul and take his advice about friends. So she takes his advice, and of course, her and the Straw Hat Pirate, she's like, I want to live. The Straw Hats all smirk, and they then engage in battle with CP9. Luffy unveils his gear second and his gear third. Sanji unveils Diablo Jumbo, and Zoro does his nine sword style for the first time. This is all very good, because Robin wrecked you arc. And the reason I'm actually talking about this arc as much as I am, is because it's considered one of the greatest arcs in the series, if not the best arc. And this is when she officially joins the crew. But after they defeat CP9, she can, she considers herself, she considers herself a fully fledged member, because everybody else already did, but at that point, she considers herself a full member, and after that, you can tell she's a different character. She's more relaxed, she, she makes more jokes, and she's a lot more trusting, and she's a lot more like, I'm with my Nakama, I'm with my family, I'm going to be fine, because they're going to protect me, just like I'm going to protect them no matter, <coughs> no matter what. Now, I do want to talk about her fighting ability. Well, her ability is very powerful. She can create lens from any angle. Her ability is powerful, but what you need to understand is that Robin isn't a fighter, and she has actually not had really any fights throughout the series. She had a brief scuffle with Hakuba, but besides for that, she had no fights in this series. Which, I'm a little annoyed about, but that's a whole other video. But guys, I have gone over practically everything you could need to know about Robin. I hope you enjoyed the video. Please like, comment, and subscribe for more videos, and tune in next week for episode 10 of the Beginner Guide to One Piece, the history of Chopper, but guys, above all else, have a great day. I know this was a super long video, but listen, there was a lot to cover with Robin, so it was super long. I'm sorry about that. Hopefully the history of Chopper will be shorter, but guys, have a great day. The One Piece Nation, signing out. Peace.